Today's talk will be about squirrels and their management and identification presented by Dr. Neve Quinn, the Human Wildlife Interactions Advisor with the UC Cooperative Extension Program and uh, UCIPM. Uh, Neve is based at the South Coast Research and Extension Center in Irvine and serves um, a few counties in Southern California. Neve's research and educational program deal with everything from mice to mountain lions in residential and industrial areas, but currently she focuses on rodents, their management and pathways and effects of rodenticides on non-target wildlife. Neve, uh, you can go ahead and um, share your screen and you can begin your presentation whenever you'd like. All right, folks, as Carrie said today, I'm going to talk about squirrels um, I'm going to try and cover um, tree squirrels and ground squirrels because I know um, a lot of people participating today probably have some issues with both. Um, you know, we have it, it's kind of complicated in California because in California we have the squirrels that live in the trees. They're called tree squirrels and the squirrels that live on the ground and they're called ground squirrels. So definitely don't get them confused. Now, identification can be a little bit tricky sometimes um the one thing that you should remember is that if you startle a squirrel and you're not sure what it is it's unlikely that a ground squirrel will run up a tree they usually will ret retreat into the ground now i'm not saying that ground squirrels can't climb trees they definitely can and sometimes you go to like a park that has, you know, if you have a park that has a nice turf area, but has like, you know, bushy things around it or trees, sometimes you will see um, a ground squirrel up in that tree, looking out, being the sentinel for the group, trying to see what's going on. If you get close enough, almost always that squirrel will run down that tree and ret retreat into its burrow. Now there's two main ground squirrels in California and I'm mostly based in Southern California. So I'm more familiar with the, um, the California ground squirrel, but there is one other species that some of our Northern California participants might be familiar with. And that is the Belding's ground squirrel. So on the left, we have the Belding's ground squirrel and on the right, we have the California ground squirrels. Um, and the California ground squirrels are kind of gray brown fur and they're semi bushy tails. Whereas these guys here, let me get my, um, my pointer on, these guys here, they have this little bitty bushy tail. And um, now both of these species are social, which means that there's generally lots of them in bigger groups, which is why we have problems sometimes. Um, and they have lots of damage, you know, consume vegetables, vegetation, they girdle trees, and um, they chew irrigation lines, and then their burrows can be problematic. <coughs> Excuse me. And it's important to know the difference between the two, because if you look up here, we have tree squirrels and down here we have ground squirrels. You can see that the management options for them are quite different. So there's baiting options for ground squirrels, but not for tree squirrels. There are burrow fumigation options for ground squirrels, but more for tree squirrels. You can, to a degree, exclude um, tree squirrels, but not necessarily ground squirrels. Um, and then there's other options that are not really that great um, of an option. Now, I'll tell you one thing about ground squirrels that will help you identify them is that they have this saddle on their back and it's kind of this paler color compared to, compared to this darker gray or the dark, darker gray brown that they have here. But they also have this white circle around their eye, which can help as well. And they do cause a lot of damage. And the one way to tell damage, um, which is not always easy, but it can help is if you look at how big their the incisor marks are on your fruit and you can see on this one here this particular avocado that i pulled out of my boss's backyard actually you can see that the incisor marks are really wide and so you would expect that something bigger made that and that's where the ground squirrel in came in whereas if it was a mouse or a rat they'd be much smaller and closer together and as i managed they or as i mentioned they cause a lot of damage and so there's reasons why we manage down skirt there are ground squirrels their mounds are a tripping hazard you know you can fall over them or fall in them and um, if you have irrigation lines they can chew them and um, they obviously um if you're a part in, in like a you know if you're in a golf course or a park they can cause a lot of damage to very valuable turf and landscape plants they're obviously vectors of disease you know our last case of plague in california i believe the source was the california ground squirrel and then you know they move a lot of soil around and can cause lots of 
you know, they can compromise buildings and and um, and structures, roadways. I know here, particularly in our parks in Orange County, often the if we have like these small paths or roadways in our parks, what will happen is, is that the squirrels will burrow under them, and the um, the paths or the pavement can um, uh, collapse. And obviously, they eat your everything. They literally squirrels would eat everything. You know, if it's in your backyard and it's growing, a squirrel will eat it essentially. Um, and so in this case, it's an avocado, but they will eat citrus if it's fallen to the ground. Um, they'll even clip, um, you know, landscape plants. So they, they essentially will eat a lot of things. I don't know if I've ever met anything that squirrel wouldn't eat. Now, there's loads of different strategies for ground squirrels. I would say actually ground squirrels and gophers have the most strategies and probably the most successful strategies of all our rodents in California. Um, <coughs> excuse me, but it's important to focus on a broad range of, of things. Not one thing is probably going to work, but a combination of a few might. And, and then there may not be options in some places. Some place, you know, maybe you're an ag applicator, maybe you're an urban applicator, or maybe there is, you know, endangered species, you know, maybe there's non-target issues. Those are the things that you have to consider when you're trying to develop what your management strategy is. And squirrels are a little different, I think, than other um, rodents that we try to um, control because they have seasonal differences in how successful their management is. And, and this graph here is from the Ground Squirrel Best Management Practices website, which we'll mention a little bit later on. And, you know, we always talk about IPM and how important it is to understand the biology of the animal that you're trying to manage. And I think ground squirrels are a classic example of that because especially if you look here, if you look here at the difference between the success of two very efficacious control measures, so both fumigation and toxic baits, and they're highly effective, but not at the same time of the year. Um, and so it's important to know well, there's a, the reason why is, is to do with soil moisture, but also to do with the diet of the of the, the squirrels. So it's important to know things like this. And this is not just for squirrels and it's not just for vertebrates. It's for all pests that we try to manage. Then people are always interested in biocontrol. And so that's like the use of predators to control um, everything. You know, you could you could have even birds controlling invertebrates or bats controlling invertebrates. And, and in this case, what we're talking about is we're talking about birds of prey, owls, hawks, um, controlling ground squirrels. Now, the one thing I will say is that owl boxes are not appropriate for ground squirrels. Ground squirrels are awake during the day, owls are not. Um, and there's a lot of research going into a lot of these control methods now in agricultural areas. Um, and and it, 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 some of them are showing moderate success. However, it's not usually an option in urban areas, but that's not saying that it's not something that you could consider. The problem with using vertebra or using birds of prey to control vertebrate pests is, is that most of our vertebrate pests are what we call our selected species, which means that they're really, really good colonizers, which means that they can live in the shittiest of the shittest land, essentially, like really crappy areas. They could be in the penthouse, but they could also be in the flooded basement, essentially, if, if you're trying to think of like, you know, one extreme to the other. As long as there's a little bit of food and a little bit of shelter for them, they can live there. And it's really hard to manage pests like that because they can colonize, they can reproduce and they can move outwards. And so predators are not generally known to control any of our selected species in biology that we know of. But like I said, there's a lot of information, a lot of research going into this. And just because we don't have a huge amount of information on, on how it works now doesn't mean that we won't in the future or won't develop um, techniques to, to make, to it work but to help it be more effective and um, the one thing that is important is and you might be interested in this pilot study I mean it's not published paper it's not scientific research but it, um, it kind of gives you an insight to what's going on and um, um, where they try to use raptors to control the squirrels on levees levees are the number one reason or squirrels are probably one of the number one reasons why levees collapse in California there's a zero tolerance for burrowing rodents on flood structures in California and so it's important to use techniques that we know are very, very efficacious as opposed to ones that we're not even sure work very well. Um, but it's also important not to rely just on one thing. We need to make sure that we have an IPM approach to the problem. The people always ask me about habitat modification, get this, this question all the, all the, all the time. And, and 
ground squirrels generally like the edge. So they generally don't like to live in the middle of things. They like to live in, in the edge of areas that are quite, well, I wouldn't say quite bare, but like give them a good vantage point of what's going on because they want to see what's coming at them from the ground and they want to see what's going to attack them from the air as well. Now, we don't recommend that you manipulate the vegetation in a way that would make the vegetation very, very high because all that will do is introduce a whole load of other pests into your area. And um, one thing that you might consider is, is that a lot of the time your flood control structures are a great source of squirrels. And I know we have some ag department people online today, so not to throw them under the bus, but um, you know, it's important to make sure that we're managing as a community. So if you're not doing our, their part, they're not doing their part, it's important that you make sure that you work together um, to make sure that the squirrels are controlled properly. Um, now we see people that do habitat modification, thin things out, and then they essentially just drop what looks like a squirrel condo on the side. And so this is an intensively managed almond orchard um, where they're removing like, you know, removing harbage or whatever, but they're putting it right on the edge. And so this is perfect. And, and I don't know if you can see, but you can see like all these little tiny openings here that are likely for ground squirrels. OK, and so why I say they generally like bare ground, I don't mean like totally bare. Right. So this is obviously covered over, but you can see what I mean, where the bare ground is around it. You can also do something called deep disking, which even in this kind of area is very, very um, limiting. But what it does is it tears up the the burrows and. Um, it can be successful for gophers, a little bit successful for ground squirrels. It's kind of difficult to do in urban areas, um, but essentially what you're doing is destroying the burrow, but you have to go really deep. And so really deep in an urban area is, is kind of hard, but it may be a better option if you're an applicator or a manager in an agricultural area. Now, there are some baiting options. For California ground squirrels, there are two of these, anticoagulant rodenticide and zinc phosphide. Um, there's two types of anticoagulant rodenticide. There's first generation and second generation anticoagulant rodenticide. But the first generation anticoagulant rodenticides are the ones that are registered for use for California ground squirrels, the chlorofacinone and difacinone. And um, these are restricted use for ag applications. Um, and so you need to make sure that you're, um, you know, you're, you're properly licensed or, you know, you're um, supervised by someone that's uh, properly licensed. Now there are many baiting like applications that you can do. You can use bait stations, you can broadcast it like this, and this is mostly for agricultural areas, or you can spot bait. Okay, the one thing is that remember this is mostly for, uh, for um, agricultural areas that if you're applying an anticoagulant rodenticide, you have to make sure, or any actually rodenticide, you have to make sure that you're considerate of some things. First of all, first generation anticoagulant rodenticide requires multiple feedings, um, which means that the animal has to come over back over and over and over again. So it's important to follow the label and maintain a fresh supply of bait because a failure to apply anticoagulant rodenticide baits correctly can promote all sorts of things. So like chemical resistance, which means that they eat the bait, but they don't die from it, which is not good at all for secondary exposure. Um, obviously secondary exposure is not good in general, but this would make it way worse. You can get behavioral resistance with certain products as well. And then bait shyness, which means that if, if it makes them a little bit sick and they don't come back to get the final dose, then they, you know, they, they may not or they will not die. Now, there's different bait station options um, for ground squirrels. This is like the T post, which you would see often in agricultural areas or maybe some what we call non-production ag areas like parks, cemeteries, things like this. And there's also this commercially available station here and um, where the bait supplied up here and then the animals enter in here. Now, people ask me a lot about um, secondary exposure to predators like up the food chain while managing ground squirrels with secondary or with sorry, with first generation anticoagulant rodenticides. And so Dr. Baldwin up in Davis did an assessment of the secondary toxicity of difacinone. Um, and basically what they did was they radio collared squirrels, let them go and then expose them to anticoagulant rodenticides by, by like a free choice, like the, the, the squirrel had to come and, and check it out. And then they would retrieve the dead individuals. And so this is Ryan in a hole, um, in a big hole, in a big ground squirrel burrow that he basically jackhammered into to find the dead squirrel. And, and really what was interesting was is that the number 
of squirrels that were dying that were accessible to predators was actually very low. So I think this is good news for agricultural production, pr production where plate people are worried about exposure to predators. Now, I'm not saying that there's not like two or three and we, and we know that some were scavenged. And um, so that could move up the food chain, but the majority of which they're not moving up the food chain. Now, I mentioned zinc phosphide as well. Zinc phosphide is an acute toxicant, which means it, it doesn't need multiple feedings to work. But because it doesn't need multiple feedings and because it's acute, it means that the animals can develop potential bait shyness. Um, it can be used for spot treatments um, and broadcast baiting, but it can't be used in and around buildings and it can't be used in bait stations either. So this is more of a product that you would see applied in more agriculture or non-production ag sites, like I said, like parks and cemeteries and things like that. Now, if you go to the, um, the Ground Squirrel Best Management Practices website, there is kind of the pros and cons list of the first generation anticoagulant or side and the zinc phosphide um, and I won't go through those, but there is, you know, there's different um, pros and cons to efficacy, bay acceptance, uh, secondary, even primary toxicity as well. Um, and so I'll give you that site in a minute so you can look at it. Now let's talk about fumigation. So fumigation involves the use of a poison gas in burrows to control ground squirrels. And it always works better when your soil is moist. Um, and so that's why when you looked at the table that I showed you really early on in the biology slide, that's one of the reasons why fumigation works so well in the early part of the year, because the soil is wetter. And when the soil is wet, it traps in the gas. And so then the gas is more effective. Now, there's all sorts of application, all sorts of different gases that can be used both in agriculture and both in urban areas. But the one thing to consider is, is that all gases, whether it's aluminum phosphide, carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide, they're all toxic to humans. OK, so you have to be very careful because ground squirrel burrows are very, very extensive. They like they can be, you know, really long, really deep. And sometimes it could be, you know, like over there, over in your yard or over behind a school or something. And then it could move towards the building. So it's important that you don't use your fumigants in and around buildings to make sure that you don't get the gases coming back out like the other side. Um, aluminum phosphide must be used um, out of doors only for the control of burrowing rodents in a lot of different areas, um, most of which are not urban. This is a highly restricted product. If you're an unlicensed homeowner, you will not be able to apply this. And if you want your pest control company to apply it, you have to be, um, they have to apply it more than 100 feet from your home. It's a very, very effective tool, but it's very, very dangerous. Um, you know, it's a very, very toxic gas. Um, aluminum phosphides can be applied only in athletic fields and schools as well. So for any of the licensees that are on here that are treating um, urban areas, um, you know, aluminum phosphide works very, very well, but it must be used only in athletic fields. And it can only apply, be applied in borough systems that are more than 100 feet away from a building that is a potentially occupied. So it doesn't have to be currently inhabited by people, but it could be potentially occupied, which means you still have to be 100 feet away. And we know that we can use these for ground squirrels and studies are showing up to 100% efficacy for California ground squirrels and very, very high as well for Belling's ground squirrels. And um, so we know that aluminum phosphide works very, very well. It's just not always the best option, especially if you're in urban areas. Um, like I said, it's a highly restricted material. You have to be licensed, requires restricted use permits. Um, and you have to be supervised by you have to be a qualified applicator or supervised by a qualified qualified applicator also <coughs> excuse me and um, it requires that you have a fumigation management plan and it, this is all for very very good reasons you know this is a very very um deadly um tool i mean essentially all vertebrate pest, pesticides are toxic to humans um but this can be very dangerous and has been very dangerous in the future now luckily there's been no serious incidents in california but there has been other serious incidents um when there's been misapplications of this product um, now this is one of my goals in life is to use these devices where you inject propane into the ground and you blow everything up um Obviously not a great option for many, many urban areas. Also, please don't do this, which is set half the field on fire. Um, you know, the, anywhere in California right now that is, is, you know, involves fire, I'm not that excited about recommending it because um, 
a really easy way to kill a ground squirrel and everything else is just to set everything on fire. Um, and so that's not recommended, obviously. And there's obviously serious worker safety concerns for this. And it's also been shown to be not that efficacious. So this would be a tool that you would need to use in conjunction with something else. Um, because obviously it does destroy the burrows, um, which we know helps to slow down the reinvasion, but it's not a great option for actual um, management on its own. Gas carriages are also fairly decent for ground, California ground squirrels. Um, it's important that um, when you apply it, that you, oops, excuse me, you apply it with the, um, the fuse the other way around. Um, so you make sure you put the cartridges in fuse first. Um, these work really, really well for California ground squirrels, absolutely terribly for gophers. So I know there's some of them that are called gopher whatever, but they don't really work for gophers with very, very low efficacy for gophers. So don't use them for gophers. If you wanna use them for ground squirrels, absolutely do not use them for gophers. And um, we know that they work really well for California ground squirrels up to about 86% efficacy and really good for building ground squirrels as well. But be careful because they burn really hot um, once you light the fuse. And I know that because I have a scar in between my fingers here for where I put one in a burrow and it was a very small burrow and, and the fuse bent back and then caught me in between the fingers and there were there were many many swear words anyway there's lots of new technology which is really great and this is what's great about california ground squirrels and gopher management is, is there's always lots of new technology and tools coming on board which is really important because a lot of the time the older tools become restricted so it's really great that we have these new tools and these new tools involve the application of carbon monoxide gas and carbon dioxide gas. And we haven't tested all of them, um, but Dr. Baldwin up in Davis has some um, data on the perk machine. And so if you want to know what the perk machine is, this is the perk machine here. And so this one, this one, this one, and this one are all carbon monoxide devices. And this one here is a carbon dioxide device. So these, the, the perk machine and the cheetah are both carbon monoxide. And so it, this is a good graph or good um, table because it just shows you that not all, all tools are built equally. And so what's interesting is, is for in moist soil, the perk machine was shown to be 100 percent effective, which is, you know, obviously exactly what you want in dry conditions, not so much. And you're kind of looking for like that 70 percent efficacy for it to be worth your while. Right. You really want it to be. You want to be killing more squirrels than they're reproducing, essentially. You know, that's really what you're looking for, that 70% efficacy. Now, the cheetah didn't do so well, but that doesn't mean a lot of these tools are improving constantly. But for example, here, just saying control number one, when Dr. Baldwin started, if there was 100 squirrels, there was 116 squirrels left. So I don't know what the cheetah is blowing down there. Is it like Barry White music and, you know, a romantic dinner? But there's basically more squirrels being created somehow. Um, and so, you know, not all tools are created equally. And it's not just the, the, the like how effective it is. Efficacy involves cost as well. And so you can see that some things are, are much more costly um, per acre than other things. So aluminum phosphide and, and the application of the first generation diphasinone is way cheaper than the use of the perk machine or the gas cartridge. But for example, the, the perk machine has multiple hoses. So like the perk machine may be cheaper than something that only has one hose. Um, so that's interesting too. And then don't forget that CO2 is fairly recently registered in California as well, which is, you know, it's great. We need more tools and, and you know, we need more tools that aren't causing or, you know, resulting in potential either primary or secondary in, um, exposure. Now remember that, whatever is in the burrow, if, if it breathes air, it's going to die. Um, or if it breathes carbon, you know, if it, if it can breathe it in, it's probably going to die. This is another tool that's quite interesting, the burrow blocker, it, it injects a, um, a, a slurry of sand and water um, into the squirrel burrow. I think this is probably a great tool potentially for replacing soil that has been um, eroded. I don't know how good it is for your soil. Uh, and it's, you know, it's kind of marketed as more humane because if there's no chemicals involved, but um, essentially you're drowning your squirrel um, or suffocating your squirrel um, as well. So like it's, it's, it's as humane as many other tools. There's some logistical issues though, 
with the the burrow blocker as well is that you can't fight gravity so a lot of the time especially in levees um, a squirrel burrow in and up and so i don't know how good you are but you're probably not going to defy gravity and make the water go up we also have trapping options as well we've got like different types of body gripping traps kind of bears um and there is you know you can place them outside outside kind of boxes and um, if you're not concerned about non targets or inside boxes, if you are and um, so the um, you can modify gopher traps into squirrel traps and those instructions are on the IPM tree squirrel pest note um, and the address is there, but just in case it's um, um, an old one i'll have Belinda put it or Carrie put it in the in the chat, so you can see it Um. You can use live traps um, and, you know, wire type traps like this are very common, especially these ones, which catch multiple animals. And so they're they're useful and, and they can be very good, but they're kind of tricky because once you catch the animal, it's alive and um, essentially anything with a mouth can bite you and a ground squirrel will. Um, and the problem with live trapping is, is that live trapping requires animal euthanasia. And it has to be done humanely. You can't squish it. You can't drown it. You can't kill it with something that's not legal in the state of California. And um, you have to use CO2 flow. And, and we're in the process of updating this. And um, it is a little bit behind. We follow the um, American Medical Veterinary Association guidelines for euthanasia. They're very, very important. And it shows that it, it basically shows that at certain levels of flow rate, so the amount that you displace oxygen by um is humane between x and x and so it's important that you use pressurized co2 so you cannot hook it up to your tailpipe um and if it's legal to do so you can shoot to euthanize your animal as well but most people just don't have those options now speaking of shooting shooting can be an effective method for um controlling ground squirrels although it's fairly labor intensive and not really recommended if you have an insane population of ground squirrels and it's important that you know understand that lead bullets are no longer al allowed actually they're banned statewide in california since 2019 so you can't use lead bullets because you can't use lead bullets there's issues with follow through and all sorts of things so just be careful if that is something that you consider now, I did mention the Ground Squirrel Best Management Practices website, www.groundsquirrelbmp.com. That basically has everything you ever wanted to know about ground squirrels and everything you didn't want to know about ground squirrels. Um, so make sure you, um, you go and you check out that um, website before you contact um, anyone about um, ground squirrel management, because I would be pretty sure that the answer is in there. Um, I want to plug the Green Bulletin and the IPM newsletter because they have two articles in there on both on what I'm about to talk about next, which is tree squirrels. Um, and so one of them helps you tell the difference between tree squirrels and ground squirrels. And one of them is more in depth about ground squirrel management. And these are the links here. And so I, um, in case those are wrong, I'll have um, Belinda or Carrie pop that in the chat too, just so you can get um, into. And these are um, great publications. And um, I think Carrie and Belinda be better at describing it, but one's more focused towards um, professional applicators. Um, and then there, this one here is I think more for um, people that are not licensed applicators of pesticide. So let's talk about the different squirrels. One of my favorite squirrels, the Western gray squirrel, I think is one of the most beautiful squirrel, tree squirrels I've ever seen. They're so pretty. I, my friend Jim Hartman brought me up to the Cleveland National Forest and showed me, um, well, showed me a lot of things, but we saw Western um, gray squirrels when we were up there and they're absolutely gorgeous. Um, large body, large bushy tail. They're this beautiful gray color and they almost, their tails almost like silver tips. Um, and they're a native squirrel and so we want these squirrels in our in our in our woodlands in California and it's really important that we do everything we can to keep them there. This guy causes a lot of problems everywhere and um, so this is the eastern grey squirrel and um, kind of has narrow ears kind of a shorter tail it's kind of like even though it's grey it's kind of got like an orangey tinge on it and um, and this grey squirrel came 
from the eastern United States, but the eastern United States, they brought it to Great or to England, and then the English brought the bad thing to Ireland as well. So we don't, I don't like this one at all. Um, causes insane levels of issues for our native squirrel in Ireland, the, the, the red squirrel as well. So it's not good to have um, non-native species in your environment, even when they don't cause damage, um, which they do. But in this case, they cause damage to your native species, which I think is bigger than when they eat my avocados. Um, so that's not good. This guy, I think there's probably a lot of people in California that are very, very familiar with this guy, especially if you're in Southern California, the Eastern Fox Squirrel is kind of more of an orangey squirrel. Um, and they're um, kind of a brownie orange on the back and kind of more of an orange on the front. Um, they're also fairly large. And like I said, they have this fairly distinct like yellow, brown, orange coat, okay? And then this little cutie pie here, the Douglas Squirrel, they make very distinct vocalizations. Um, almost like chirping, like almost like a bird. Um, and they're a beautiful native squirrel as well. So you can tell I, I'm like beautiful, ugly, ugly, beautiful. So the natives I all think are very good looking squirrels. I'm not so sure about the, um, the invasives. And so why would you manage invasive squirrels? Health and safety issues, agricultural pests, pests upon orchards, and then environmental impacts. They prey on birds, they prey on eggs, and they outcompete our native wildlife. Now, I'm not going to harp on too much about the fishing game code. I will recommend that if you have really bad insomnia that you go and check it out because it's the most verbose piece of literature I've ever read in my whole entire life. I'm still trying to get my head around it. But chapter 2, 307 focuses on um, resident small game, so tree squirrels. And tree squirrels in the fish and game code are horrendously complicated because they treat native and non-native squirrels almost the same because they refer to gray squirrels. And so we have gray squirrels, which are, which are invasive, and native gray squirrel, western native west gray squirrels, which are native. And so it's very, very complicated. And um, they talk about taking squirrels. So like basically like trapping, shooting, sending them to Jesus, etc. cetera. Um, it's important to make sure that you do it legally if you're doing so. And so if you're really confused, those, those articles in the Green Bulletin and the IPM newsletter, they really, really help because Eastern Fox Squirrels, so this guy here is, is rapidly becoming one of the most injurious first of a pest, first of a pest to homes and gardens and urban and suburban environments. And so there are big concerns for public parks and areas that are kind of interface, like so the, the WUI, the Wildland Urban Interface. Um, and it's funny, um, you know, we have some issues down here in Southern California with coyotes attacking people, biting children. But I always thought it was interesting that the city of Long Beach always had way more squirrel bites than they actually did coyote bites. In fact, I don't know if, they have, if they've had a coyote bite in, in any in, in the last 10 years, but they get multiple squirrel bites in a year. Um, and then the decline of the Western gray squirrel due to competition, you know, this is just not good. Um, if fox squirrels are found to be injuring growing crops or other property, they may be taken in any legal manner in accordance with the Fish and Game Codes. So that's the big verbose piece of literature. And here's where it gets com confusing. Only eastern fox squirrels can be killed without a hunting license or permit. However, if you're any trapper for hire, you have to possess a valid trapping license. And so a valid trapping license is required for sport hunting of tree squirrels also. So I, I won't lie, this is very, very complicated, but it is all summarized in that article. And so if a landowner legally shoots a depredating eastern fox squirrel outside the hunt, a hunting season, a hunting license is not required. I'm sure you're all horrendously confused already. Remember, no lead bullets. So if you are shooting it, you can't do so with lead bullets. Now there's several types of kill traps that could be used for Eastern fox squirrels, okay? Um, if you have them in your backyard and that's something that you're interested in taking care of. And um, now we have something called the, it's kind of like referred to, I guess, um, informally as the 150 yard rule, which states that traps must be set within 150 yards, or traps may not be set, sorry, within 150 yards, of any structure used as a permanent or temporary residence unless such traps are set by a person controlling such property or by a person who has and is carrying with, with him 
him, her, them, um, written consent of the landowner. So you don't need to tell everybody within 150 yards if it's in your own property. Um, if you're doing it privately, as long as the trapper has written, written permission from you, you don't have to tell everybody within 150 yards. So like this bit is the or bit is very, very important. Now we have all sorts of traps. Um, you know, we have um, the tunnel trap here. Um, and you can put it on a tree branch. This has been fairly effective in Southern California, although we've no data on it yet, but um, you know, putting it on um, like a two by four essentially and putting it at a 45 degree angle against the um, against the, the fence or a tree or something like that. And then we talked about this for ground squirrels, you can modify um, the gopher trap as well. Now, the conibear, and I think someone in particular may recognize their backyard here, um, so thanks to um, one of our master gardeners from Orange County for providing these pictures. The conibear can be a good trap for um, trapping tree squirrels, but it's very hard to set. Um, and if you catch your hand in here, you catch your foot in here, it'll probably break your foot, probably break your arm. Um, it'll turn a cat inside out, for example. Um, it'll you know snap off a toddler's arm. These things are heavily sprung like very, very effective trap, but very heavily sprung. So you might want to think about excluding other wildlife from this trap if it's something that you're going to use in your in your um, house, because if it, anything that walks through here is going to die. Um, it's kind of complicated to, um, to turn gopher traps into um, tree squirrel traps, but the instructions are on the tree squirrel pest note as far as I'm aware, so make sure you look into that. Now, sometimes people suggest ordinary rat snap traps, but they're not good enough. I would not recommend rat snap traps for anything other than rats. All you're going to do is either temporarily disable your squirrel um, or you're going to maim it. And you know, if you're going to kill something, you have to kill it humanely. We're not going to all sit here and, and lie that we're not interested in you know, sending things away from our yard this is not a recommended or humane way to do it. Now, there are other squirrel traps, and I'm not sure of all of them, but there's something like this, the Cania trap, um, also very, very heavily sprung trap, very, very um, heavy. Um, that means it's a heavy bar, essentially, like it snaps hard and fast. And what happens is, is the bar will come down the neck. Um, but these are things that you can put up trees. And so... Um, a lot of the time you won't get non-targets in them if you set them up the tree because the only thing that's going to go near it is the um, the trap. Now, remember with live traps, you know, it's the same with ground squirrels. You can use these. Now, you can use a cage trap, a single cage trap. I've never heard of anyone using a multi a multi capture trap for tree squirrels. Um, but it's really important that once you catch it, the two options you have are either let it go where you caught it or euthanize it. It is illegal to release eastern fox squirrels or any other wildlife um, off your properties. You can't drive it to the park and let it go. Bad wildlife practice. It's bad for your neighbors. It's bad for the wildlife that you're releasing. It's bad for the wildlife in the area. That's one of the reasons why we have so many invasive species because people are catching them and releasing them other places. Once again, remember, it is illegal to drown wildlife, okay, right? You do not do it. And there's a reason you don't do it. It's not humane. Um, you know, it's, it's important if you're going to kill something that you do it humanely. And so we talked about CO2 briefly, but you have to use it from compressed. Remember, compressed CO2. Um, the fill rate is about 30 to 70 percent. And that shows that there's not a lot of pain or distress caused because sudden, sudden exposure of conscious animals to carbon dioxide has been shown to be distress, distressful. So you don't pre-fill your chamber generally. You put it in there and you slowly displace your oxygen. Um, it's expected your conscious, your un, time to unconsciousness essentially is about two to three minutes. And so you, you will have a dead animal fairly rapidly and you can look for things like lack of color in the eye. Um, a lot of people say that you can like touch the corner of the eye to look for a reflex. I would just make sure that your squirrel is well and truly dead before you check that, because if it's not, um, it's not going to end well for your finger. And if you think they're dead, just give it another minute just in case. OK, and you can make your um, your chambers 
from a lot of different things. You can even use a garbage bag, but you just need to know what your volume is. But a lot of people use, um, what's the American word for it? Hold on a second, ice chests. A lot of people use ice chests and they have that little faucet coming off it. And the faucet, you can just stick the hose from your CO2 tank and there's CO2 available from all sorts of places across California. Um, you'd be surprised where you can pick up CO2. Um, and this is from the Ground Squirrel Best Management Practices website as well. Like I said, we are updating that, but this is basically gives you the general idea of how to collect, how to calculate flow rate. Um, so I wanted to leave some time for questions. So that's all we have for today. But if we don't have time for questions or you don't feel like asking your question on the chat or I don't get to it, um, feel free to contact me. You can email me, which is definitely the best way to do it. You can definitely call me and leave a message because I won't answer my phone more than likely. And please follow us on social media. We are on Twitter at SCUWM Council. Um, and we're also on Instagram where we tweet a lot about our, um, our coyote work, our rat work um, at Cosmopolitan Coyotes. Um, so thank you very much. Um, thank you so much, Neve, for joining us today. We'll have you back to talk about some other critter uh, very soon as your schedule allows.